Okay, um, so this is the agenda. I'm gonna skip this slide because we're already running late. Um, so we're a edX solutions provider. Um, we are uh, headquartered in Mass Massachusetts, just down the street from edX. Um, and those are some of our customers. So interoperability, what do we mean when we say interoperability? So the definition in Merriam-Webster is the ability of a system to work with or use the parts or equipment of another system. Or in other words, uh, it can be best illustrated by this photo entitled Adapter Frenzy. Uh, if, you've ever, if you've ever traveled to a uh, foreign country, um, you probably know the pain of trying to get your electronics to interoperate with different plug systems. So um, we've been doing a lot of work with a lot of different customers, and so this talk is really a culmination of those observations. Um, and our customers, uh, Doug is one of them, come to us with all kinds of wacky requests. Um, some, so sometime, <laughs> sometimes it's, it, uh, you know, you can really think of open edX as, um, in many bigger companies, uh, edX is just one piece of a larger puzzle, right? So these companies want to have a 360 degree view of their customers, um, which means pulling in data from different sources, edX just being one of those, those data sources. Um, sometimes people ask us, okay, can we integrate with a proprietary uh, single sign-on solution? And to which we reply, um, have you heard of SAML or OAuth2? <laughs> um, so just because you can modify the, the core edX platform code base doesn't mean you should. So really what I'm, what I'm trying to talk about in this, in this talk is how you can get open edX to play nicely with existing systems rather than trying to reinvent the wheel Let's make it work within a larger ecosystem. Um, so these are just a few of the observations that we've, uh, that we've made from trying to do these kind of integrations. Um, is that lightweight integration is better than tight coupling. Um, the larger the organization, the more systems that they have that they need to integrate with. Um, and easily getting data in and out of edX is critical, right? Because people want to pull the data out and use it for other purposes and they want to get data in. So I want to talk about um, different means of how you can actually get uh, OpenEdX to integrate with other systems. So depending on what type of integration you're looking to do, um, there are several different ways. Um, one is at the courseware level. So this is if you're you know, trying to add a new component to the courseware. Um, you could use Xbox, uh, you could use LTI, you could use uh, JS input. Um, and now you can use SCORM as well. And Tin Can is like on the horizon. That's another, another standard that a lot of people are starting to use. Um, there's single sign-on. Uh, so how do you integrate OpenEdX so that people don't have to learn another username and password? They can use their existing one. And OAuth2, SAML, Shibboleth, these are all natively supported on the OpenEdX platform. Um, APIs. So how can I do programmatic enrollment? How can I take a student that's just enrolled in my uh, in-house system and enroll them in a course in edX without making them have to go click the enroll button. Um, <coughs> analytics, a lot of people have existing analytics tools that they wanna use. Um, Google Analytics is probably the most simple one. Um, how do you get those things to play nicely in edX? And then you have the, the raw data dump. So if, if the existing analytics tools that edX provides are not sufficient, how do you get access to all that raw data, the MySQL data, the MongoDB, the tracking logs? Uh, and then lastly, and this is the one that we try to avoid if at all possible, <laughs> this is making, doing custom, um, actually forking the edX platform code and, and adding new capabilities to it. So we try to avoid this wherever possible, but in some cases it's, it's the best we can do. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the integrations that we've done. Uh, these are just a few that, um, we've come across as we've been working with different customers. So video hosting providers, um, like Inner Systems here, they use Brightcove. YouTube is not the best choice for a lot of companies because they have video that they don't want to host in a, in a public space like YouTube. They want to have it on a private, a private secure hosting. Um, content delivery networks, maybe you're delivering content to other parts of the world um, and you want to make sure that those videos are performing as fast and as seamlessly as possible. You might use a, a CDN like CloudFront or Akamai. Uh, Real-time video chat. Um, 
is Jesus from Big Blue Button in the room still? There he is. So, so Jesus is from Big Blue Button, and they make a uh, web video conferencing platform um, called Big Blue Button that can integrate with any LMS that supports LTI. So because OpenEdX supports LTI, we can actually integrate that web conferencing system into the edX platform so that students can join a real-time video event without having to log into another system. Um, CRM, so uh, Andrew, who's, who's in the room, is from uh, Equient, and they're using Intercom to basically in-app message people, in, and Mike is also here, uh, to in-app message people as they're taking courses and send them like little upsell messages and hey, did you know you took this course, you could take this other course. Um, we're gonna get to that in a little bit. And we've also done integrations with Salesforce, so that's another, another uh, really popular tool that people like to integrate with. And lastly, um, marketing automation and forums. So being able to um, do triggered email campaigns to, uh, to your users as they're going through the course and reminding them, hey, you just finished course one, why don't you take course two? Okay, so, um, just good. Um, adaptive learning is another really popular well, I shouldn't say really popular. It's becoming more popular. People want to create more personalized learning experience for their students. So it's not a one-size-fits-all model, but you can actually learn from the students as they're going through the course and uh, uh, assign them different questions based on how they answer previous questions. Um, a lot of people use Google Drive or Microsoft Office, Office, and they have a lot of content in those existing systems. So being able to integrate those existing uh, Office productivity uh, documents into their edX site is, is important. Here we have e-commerce, um, so you know being able to charge money for courses using Stripe or Magento or PayPal. Uh, we're doing an integration right now uh, that will allow students to buy a course in Magento and then uh, when they buy that course, um, enroll them in the course in, in Open edX. And then reporting is also a big one. A lot of, uh, a lot of our customers really find that open edX is lacking on the reporting side. Um, and there's a lot of reasons behind that. Probably the, the most prevalent is that open edX was really designed for the academic space to report on. It, it's a MOOC platform in its nature. So when companies start using open edX, they're looking for different types of reports than what a typical MOOC um, provides. Okay, so embedding content. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can you can do this. As I mentioned before, you have uh, OLX. Um, you could author your content directly in, in XML, although who wants to do that? Um, you have the, the iframe X block, which lets you pull in content from any arbitrary web page on the internet, and you can embed that in your edX course. Uh, JS input, this is not as often used, but it's a really powerful, if you have some JavaScript widget that you wanna use in edX, you can use JS input to to get and set, um, to send data into edX and get data out of edX. SCORM, um, I just gave a talk on the X block, so now you can get uh, SCORM content into your open <coughs> edX site. And then LTI, this is embedding content that lives in another LMS, or the reverse of that would be um, exposing content that lives in open edX to another LMS. So in the case of InterSystems, they have Totora which is a Moodle-based LMS that they use internally, and being able to pull the, the content from OpenEdX into that other LMS you can do as an LTI provider. Okay, so speaking of LTI, um, basically you have your app, that's the orange icon, you have your LMS, that's the blue icon, and from within your LMS you can launch the app and it sends the credentials off to that app so the user doesn't have to actually authenticate again. And then after the uh, user has done that exercise, it can send the grades back into edX and report the score. So this is a really great way of integrating you know, hundreds of different LTI compatible exercises into your open edX site without having to actually build native X blocks. You can just use these other third party providers and the students don't have to log into those third party systems. They just, they're by, by virtue of using LTI, they're automatically logged in. So this is an example of Cerigo, which is kind of like an interactive flashcard application that you can see is embedded inside an edX course. Um, so exposing content. So the reverse of that 
is also true where you can take, um, so the, the kind of use case for this is you've got, um, like Harvard I think had a lot of content in their MOOC sites and they wanted to be able to use that content in their residential courses. So they're really, they're really looking at edX as almost like a library, a content library, and they have all these modular learning objects that they can pull into, uh, into their other LMS. In their case, they're using Canvas. Um, and the benefits of this is you avoid teaching your, your faculty and staff or your instructors yet another tool. Um, the other thing is you can, you can have a centralized identity management so you don't have to have your faculty and staff lo logging into two different systems and all that data flows back into the LMS. Okay, um, so this is an example of a video that's, um, that was created in Studio that lives in OpenEdX but it's being pulled into Canvas. So this is a, a Canvas LMS um, course but you can see it has the interactive um, OpenEdX transcript over there. Okay, so I mentioned before programmatic enrollment. Um, most of us are used to going to an OpenEdX site, clicking the enroll button, and that's how we enroll in a course. But what if you wanted to actually enroll the student in another system and have them automatically enrolled in OpenEdX? So this is one of our customers, the Body Mind Institute, and they have this uh, WordPress site with uh, WooCommerce, and they have all these courses on nutrition and mind, uh, mind body. And when someone goes here to buy a course, it then it goes into something called Infusionsoft. Um, and Infusionsoft basically has like a workflow of all the steps that are gonna happen from when someone um, buys that course in the e-commerce system, then they get added to a newsletter, um, they, they get a confirmation email that they sign up for the course. And then what we're doing is we're essentially sending an HTTP post from Infusionsoft into OpenEdX, and we've extended the enrollment API um, by adding some additional fields. So the task is enroll user, we, we pass in a course ID, um, we pass in the first name, last name, email of the student, and that post URL, courses.bodymindinstitute.com slash Infusionsoft, is the endpoint to enroll that student in that course. So the student never actually has to go into OpenEdX and, and register um, or enroll in the course, by virtue of buying that course, they're now immediately um, enrolled in the course and they get an email saying, you've been enrolled in this course. Uh, another one of our customers has um, partners, customers and employees and each of those groups of people should see different courses. So when they go to the, the edX site, the customers should see some set of courses, the employees should see all the courses and the partners should see a different set of courses. So what we did is we basically integrated OpenEdX with Salesforce so that when a, when a new student enrolls um, in a course, it goes and checks Salesforce and finds out, is that student a customer, an employee, or a partner? And then it, it basically assigns a role to that user inside OpenEdX and that, that filters which courses they can see and which courses they can't see. And the way you define that is on the course itself. So this is the, the schedule and details page. So the course author can basically just specify which course access groups um, this course should be available to. So they can say, they can either say employees, uh, or they can say partners and customers, or they can say just, par just customers, or they can say just partners. So this, this gives the course authors a lot of um, flexibility in making these courses available to only select groups of people. Uh, and this is basically how it works with, with Salesforce is, you know, you register, um, it goes, talks to the Salesforce API and says, is, is the user nate at nate.com an employee, customer, partner? And then it looks up in the Salesforce database, um, do I find that email domain? And if I found it, then it sends it back to edX and says, okay, nate at nate.com is a partner. So assign him the partner role. And this allows our customer to basically manage all of that on the Salesforce side they can manage all their customers and their partners in a tool that they're already familiar with. So another um, thing that everyone's talking about is how do you actually, you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink, right? So how do you actually get people to complete courses? They start the courses but then they get distracted or they get busy. Um, so for one of our customers, uh, InterSystems, um, they wanted to create these learning paths. So basically when you, when you sign up for this learning path, you're enrolling in like half a dozen courses. And as you go through these courses, 
there are triggers. So edX is integrated with something called um, Marketo, which is a marketing automation tool. So what, what we've done is we basically sent from OpenEdX to Marketo when the user takes a particular action in the site. And then based on that action, that can trigger um, something on the Marketo side. Maybe they get an email, maybe they get added to a list. Um, and so in this case, we're, we're sending them a welcome email, uh, we send them a, re a reminder email, and we send them a congratulations email. And then as part of that congratulations email, we mention, hey, you just completed course one, why don't you continue to course two? So this is one way of you know, getting uh, OpenEdX to play with tools that are really good at um, nurturing students and, and customers. Um, so this is uh, the Aquient Gymnasium site. We have Mike and, and Andrew are here in the room. Um, they've, as I mentioned before, they've integrated this, this third-party tool called Intercom, which you can see over here. And when the student goes to their course, um, this little pop-up set, you know, pops up and, and, Jer and Jeremy's saying, hi Mike, we're excited to present you this live event. Um, please join us here. And so the, the Intercom knows which page you just visited w inside the inside the OpenEdX site, and it can contextually send you messages based on which pages you're visiting and which, which actions you're taking and which actions you're not taking. Um, and the gymnasium guys are also using this, uh, basically track how many opens they get, um, how many, how many click-throughs did they have, how many replied. So there's a lot of analytics on the back end of Intercom that, that they can use to kind of interact and engage with their students. Um, so Google Analytics, um, this is the Google Analytics HTML, and what Mike sort of hacked this together and just pasted in this intercom. But this is basically like five lines of code, I think, six lines of code, to embed the intercom widget in their site. So this is not a very complex integration. This is like five lines of code, and now you have intercom. You have all this in-app messages, and you have reporting, and you have all this other stuff. Okay, so syndicating course content. Um, we have a customer who has um, a CMS, a website, and then they have their LMS. And they want their CMS that has all their products to basically recommend courses that you should take. So you're, you're looking at the product page, and then they want to have the course catalog from edX sort of mapped up with their taxonomy. So if they have all these different products, they want to say, you know, I'm taking, you know, I'm, I just bought this product, I want to know what courses. So what you can do with, with OpenEdX is you can essentially uh, expose that course catalog. I'm going to show you how to do that. This is the edX.org site. Everyone has seen this before. You might think this is powered by OpenEdX, but this is actually a Drupal site. Um, so this whole faceted search over here, that's all powered by Drupal. So you might ask, well, how are they getting that content into Drupal? Um, this is another uh, site that's uh, a Russian site. So this is Cyrillic. And um, I was in Slack one day, and Sergey started saying, hey, I'm, I'm the, the DevOps guy at the open, openedu.ru. And we started chatting, and, and Ned asked him some question about, so tell us how your site is built. And as it, as it turns out, that entire, that entire site is like a Twitter bootstrap site. And there's, there's no actually dynamic stuff. It's just pulling in. It's pulling in the entire edX course catalog and rendering it all in this, this static site. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool that they had used the API to do that. So if you go to courses.edx.org slash API slash courses slash v1 slash courses, um, you can get this list of, of courses back. Um, this is all publicly available. And if you enable this API in your open edX site, you can similarly get uh, a JSON response of all the courses, and you can pull that content into your uh, your other system, maybe your, your content management system or your static site. Okay, video conferencing tools. Um, I already mentioned uh, Jesus from Big Blue Button. Um, there's a Big Blue Big Blue Button integration using LTI that allows you to embed um, something that looks like this, which gives you a whiteboard, it gives you uh, you know video chat, it gives you uh, hand raising, you can raise your hand. Um, and so this is, this is a really great application if you want to have more interactive um, you know, office hours or lectures or study groups, you can use this tool. Okay, so in summary, um, I highly recommend leveraging LTI.
to expose OpenEdX content to other systems and vice versa. Leverage LTI to pull in content from other systems into OpenEdX. Um, remember, you can use the enrollment API to programmatically enroll your, your users in your OpenEdX site. Um, similarly, you can use the course discovery API that I just showed you to expose the catalog to your CMS or some other system. Um, leverage SAML or OAuth 2 to provide single sign-on for your users. And lastly, you can use the analytics API, which I didn't actually cover, but there is an analytics API that um, you can use to pull analytics data out of edX and into other systems. Uh, and with that, I want to open it up for questions and also remind you that um, we're going to have an interoperability birds of a feather session tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, in room 292. So if we can continue the conversation there. Thank you. Um, any questions? Yeah, Carl. Well, I mentioned before that I think reporting is, is still a big gap. Um, with Open edX, you have the student dashboard, or you have the student gradebook, and then you have insights. And these are kind of like two extremes, right? The student dashboard is like too simple, or the student gradebook, and then analytics is like way over, over the top. It's like way too complicated. And I think what we need is very simple reporting about you know what students have taken what courses, what grades did they get in it, and I think that's something that should just live in Open edX, right? There, there should be a page I can go where I can see all of my students and all of my courses, and I can get basic reporting data on them. Uh, I think that right now is probably one of the biggest um, pain points for people who are trying to adopt Open edX in the corporate world. How does it work? Um, oh, I got to use this. Um, yeah, so. I don't really have any code examples here, but um, basically what we've done is we've taken, so there's, ar there's already an enrollment API that exists for Open edX. And what, what we did is we just extended the API so that a privileged user can enroll any student in any course. So the API right now just supports, it basically was designed for the mobile app, right? So if you're using your mobile app and you want to enroll in a course, you authenticate against your edX site, and then it allows you to enroll in a course, but it doesn't allow anyone to enroll in any course. So we've extended it to basically have a privileged user who can take a, a student ID and a course ID and say, put this student in this course. Um, and we've also, we've also made a bulk enrollment API, so you can do that with lots of students and lots of courses. I'm, I'm sorry? So at some point when you talked about the integration with uh, Microsoft uh, application? Yeah, so Microsoft has published a complete how-to guide for how to get Open edX to authenticate against Office 365. Um, I believe it's on the edX code mailing list. There's a link to it. Um, and if, if you're interested, I can talk to you afterwards and point you to where that information is. With what? Discourse. Discourse, yeah. To what extent is this integration done? Is it just a single sign on that allows you to plug into your platform, or do you actually have to get those embedded in the edX in some way? Yeah, I believe it's just a single sign on at this point. Um, but you could use an iframe to embed the Discourse web application inside the edX site. WebEx, yeah. yeah. So there's a company uh, called Circuit Live, um, and they they make a LTI compatible web video conferencing tool that uh, works with WebEx, GoToMeeting, and uh, Zoom. And so we've been talking with them about getting their uh, their tool integrated with OpenEdX. I think they're having some issues with the LTI compatibility. I, I guess OpenEdX is not 
speaking LTI 100% correct, and so they're having some issues with, you had this too? It's sticky and it's, yeah. it does Harvard's version of LTI, how's that? Well, if anyone is here from edX and knows who at edX is working on the LTI stuff, I'd love to chat with them, because this is kind of, this has been another pain point, is that the LTI uh, integration is, is a little bit rough. Hey, oh, hey, Mark. <laughs> it's still in beta. We don't have the full support. Mm -hmm. It was donated by um, Harvard for a specific use case. So it doesn't, it's very important that students pass the LTI 101 conformance test. Mm -hmm. So it's not a blessed LTI implementation. Um, and so it's, it's basically a subset of the full standard. Um, we need to kind of complete it out. And also the grade pass back, I know Nick mentioned a few times, it's pretty limited in what it can do. It's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the LTI provider support, yeah, provider right? Support. Yeah, so I'm, I'm talking about the LTI consumer support, which is preventing CircuLive from integrating their web video conferencing system into edX. Okay. It's a that, different... That, I don't know why. That's the only thing that I need. <laughs> well, I guarantee you there's no one at edX right now that's using that. Okay. Other questions? Yep. When rendering videos in conceptual web applications, uh, that needs to affect the data from either the Mongo or the MySQL database or something like that. Uh, do you extend edX as well, or you just convert it in a middle state to fetch the data directly and push it into the UI? You're saying if you try to get data out of Mongo or MySQL, do you, do you build that into OpenEdX or you do that as a separate module? Do you extend OpenEdX to, to do that or you build a separate module? To um, in the past, what we've done is we've we built a separate module that, um, so we built like a reporting module and that reporting module, um, it doesn't talk directly to MySQL or MongoDB. It uses the edX APIs to um, to iterate over the, the students and grab grab their grades, or iterate over the courses and grab enrollments of who's in those courses. So we're we're using the the native capabilities of, of edX, but we're doing it not inside edX platform, but as a separate module. Doug, do you want to talk about, were, were you involved at all with that Marketo integration or? Uh, or more in what it needs to do. So, so again, we, we were targeting a specific group of customers who designed learning paths and, and really uh, we worked with Aspen like to develop some triggers that send Marketo a message. This person just finished the course um, and then Marketo does certain things to track. So you knew when somebody enrolled, so Marketo can sit there and say, okay, this person who enrolled in the course, I haven't gotten any information from edX saying that they finished it yet, so therefore I'm going to do X. So <coughs> if Marketo got a, yes, this person finished course one and we, you know, gave the, uh, congratulations, you know, you're on your way. If seven days later they hadn't finished course one, Marketo hadn't gotten a message, so Marketo has a logic to run the process, the email. So there's a series of rules like that, five or six different email templates. But mostly what it was is certain triggers on a person enrolled in this course, a person was enrolled, a person completed, um, so that you, you could kind of tell those trigger points in the first couple courses, the last course, so that you could help them stick through. I guess I, I think you would be discussing specifically where would you trigger that you enrolled in course whatever. 
we hired Austin, like, just in case. Yeah. Because that's what I was about to say. Someday. Someone <laughs> tell me. Yeah, just so I'd be curious. Because it's yeah. like the old men leave. There's no yeah. real investigation into the role. Yeah, let me introduce you to Brian, who did that actual coding, and he would be a better person to ask. Of course. Yeah, so the learning path thing was a, l a little bit of a smoke and mirrors um, facade. We, we built, that's essentially a static page that, that lists all the, all the courses, um, but we did a little bit of code on the back end to auto-enroll the student in the entire learning path. So the reason we did that is because we knew edX was working on the programs functionality, and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel and basically build a whole thing in edX and then have it be deprecated as soon as edX came out with the official way of doing it. So we kind of just did that for the time being, and I'm guessing that now we'll, we'll look at how to do that with programs. Well, it wasn't our choice, it was our customer's choice. Um, I believe it, it's simply that they were selling things other than open edX courses. They're selling in-person training, and edX didn't really have a good model for selling in-person courses. Any other questions? Okay, well. I'll again remind you we're having an interoperability session 9 to 9.45 tomorrow morning, um, and we can talk more about all these, these topics then. Thank you.